The PlayStation 2. This record-selling console was released by Sony worldwide in the year 2000. Not much had changed, but everything had just changed. For some, the PS2 was a great games console, a cheap DVD player, or even a budget Linux computer. Yes, that's right, it was a thing. And part of that kit was a Sony 40 gig hard disk drive add-on that was designed to circumvent the European tax laws, or so the story goes. Allegedly, this kit was designed to allow the PS2 to run a form of Linux in order to classify as a personal computer, so that Sony could avoid paying some higher import taxes. Except that this story is somewhat wrong, mainly as it was your basic that was included on a demo disc in the EU regions, which was released with the console to evade the tax laws. In any case, it didn't work and Sony lost the court case in 2006. Sony's dabble with Linux on the PlayStation over the years is a pretty interesting story. But instead, we're going to focus on what this allows us to do now. The hard drive included with a Linux kit would normally be where Linux would be installed onto. The hard drive attached to Sony's LAN network adapter and slides into the otherwise unused expansion bay at the back. However, outside of Linux, this drive would otherwise go unused in most other software, especially in the European region with no European games officially supporting it. Normally users with the network adapter would only use this for the Ethernet LAN port at the back for online netplay and system linking, with the latter only being possible beforehand by using the 4-pin IEEE 1934 port at the front, otherwise called iLink by Sony and more commonly known as Firewire. However, it's now 2021 and soft modding is very common across many consoles, and the PS2 is no exception to this, with FreeMac Boot being the go-to method for reversible soft modding. This memory card exploit acts as a jailbreak key, which loads a hacked OSD sys at boot. And if you want to install it, you could just buy another memory card with it installed. This makes it perfect for almost all PS2 systems. Well, except the 9000 series in which Sony stopped booting from memory cards. Oh well. One popular piece of software that usually gets installed is OpenPS2 Loader, a loader designed to run PS2 games from USB over an SMB network share, or yes, the internal hard drive. Suddenly this heat producing clicky plate spinner has a modern use, and it should be noted that the HDD is not actually powered up until the software uses it, at which point the already noisy stock PS2 fan will increase its speed too. But. 40GB is very limited, with most games being released on 4.7GB DVDs and then later 8.4GB dual layer DVDs, installing these will fill up that drive very quickly. Thankfully, unlike most official software supporting the HDD and the Magic Gate security system, Homebrew software doesn't require an official Sony drive to work, and this means that any RDE drive can be used. And yes, since the connector is integrated to the network adapter, only IDE drives fit. SATA drives, using an entirely different connector, will of course, not fit. Except, that's only officially. There are now unofficial kits, which include an IDE to SATA converter, which allows us to use much more modern, more reliable and higher capacity SATA drives. Notice I didn't say faster. In this case, it doesn't matter whether you get a SATA free HDD or an SSD installed, it's still going to be limited to ATA 66 speeds. The upgrade kit I have here is designed to replace the two separate connector boards of the original IDE interface and then combine them into one single connector. The construction that Sony use is a great way to ensure compatibility with drives that have different connector spacings and one that this kit also replicates. And whilst you can buy non-genuine adapters which have a SATA or IDE port on them, these don't include any network capability which I feel is worth getting for homebrew, especially for using FTP and installing games over the network. Once taken apart, the kit simply requires unplugging the IDE and Molex power connectors and instead connecting them both to the new SATA conversion board. And with it all back together, our SATA drive fits just fine and now will work with the PS2. Just need to slide it into the back and then screw in the two slot head screws. Now the original Sony kit did include a bracket on the hard drive and whilst I'm not a fan of the drive being unsupported in the PS2, 
I've run it for a very long time with no noticeable issues, so your mileage may vary. With the new SATA HDD installed, now we can look at preparing the drive. Now, if you have a Freemac Boot memory card, you can just format the HDD with tools included with Freemac Boot to use with OpenPS2 Loader. Now, if you don't have Freemac Boot installed and also don't want to buy a Freemac Boot memory card, it's really worth it. Then the other option is to image the new drive with a softmod image. This is effectively Freemac Boot, but is designed to boot from the hard drive instead of the memory card. Unfortunately, due to the image using copyrighted code, I can't really include a link to it. However, I'm sure that those who need it will certainly be able to find it. Using the HDD to boot isn't ideal, however, as your startup time is much slower as a result. The PS2 will turn on, boot into OSD Sys, then spin up the drive, reset, and then boot into the hacked OSD Sys. Freemac Boot gets booted by the PS2 straight away with no delay. But either way, once installed, you can make your own Freemac Boot memory card by using the included installer. Now you may notice that what I've installed here doesn't match up with what I've shown you previously, and that's because on my personal Freemac Boot memory card, I don't actually use the standard configuration. I have modified the configuration so that OSD Sys looks more stock-like, so it doesn't have these arrows and it doesn't have Freemac Boot and the version. Um, this is just my personal preference, you don't have to do this. Um, you can do this through the Freemac Boot configurator and you can change almost everything. I'm not going to cover it here. Now, personally, the only reason I wanted to do this mod was so that I could play my games on the HDD drive as lasers will inevitably fail and some of my discs already don't work anymore due to scratches. You can of course add as many apps to your Freemac boot setup as you want, ranging from homebrew tools, games, emulators, the list goes on. You can then use MicroLaunch Elf to run these from USB, memory cards, the internal hard drive or even a network share. But as I usually prefer having stock looking systems and only use hard drive loading really, I've only left MicroLaunch Elf, OPL, ESR and a tool to dump the PS2 bars and keys to use with emulators. However, I'm still going to need to install some games for OPL, so let's do that. Now, as many of you might have guessed from my previous videos, I switched to using a Mac as my daily computer. And to explain how to use a Mac for PlayStation 2 hard drive loading, here is a song for you. Don't. Just don't. Problem the first. There are currently, as of 2023, no native Mac apps that help with PS2 drives. If you are running an Intel Mac then you can still use something like VirtualBox and run Windows to run these tools. However, if you're on an M1 or M2 Mac, it gets a bit more annoying as now you need to use Parallels Desktop and Windows 10 or 11 for ARM. That's not to say it can't be done, it's just annoying for me to use it personally. However, using a Windows 11 computer, I still had trouble and it comes down to the lack of any standardization. Now of the methods I tried, using a HDL installer seemed to be the most reliable, but it was not fast. The package comes with a PS2 server app and a PC client app which allows you to manage the games on the drive using a PC. However, at best, I was getting 2 megabytes per second upload speed. Now just for reference, the PS2 network adapter is a 10100 megabit capable adapter, so it's capable of going much faster, at least on the network. Plus there was a lot of frames being dropped due to transmission errors. The network cables and kit I'm using here is of a good quality and works perfectly fine at gigabit speeds, so the only thing I can think of is it's the software doing this. However, I can't complain too much at the speed as it was the only way to do this via the network that consistently worked. OPL has a built-in NBD or network block device server which allows you to manage a drive remotely. However, quite honestly, I didn't even attempt to try to get this working in Windows. It just seemed to be way too much hassle. So I actually thought that this um, glitchiness was all to do with the PS2 doing something. No, I think this display is actually um, having a bit of an issue. Go into the settings menu down here and go into, not the display info, but that's useful to tell you what I'm doing. Go into the conditioning mode. 
can see that there's still lines and stuff being displayed. I hope I've not actually destroyed this monitor because it's really useful. Finally, I also tried to use HDLV server, and the first trouble with that is trying to find where the server app is. It almost seems like it's been lost behind so many other apps and just generally isn't supported anymore, so finding it is near on impossible, and when you can, it's the wrong version. And that was a problem because outside of using a specific MBD client, I would have to use a specific HDLD server version. And of the two versions I did find, neither worked with OPL Manager, because HDLD's protocol is version specific. About the best method I found to install the games was just to remove the hard drive and then use the program to directly access the drive, such as Windows HDL install program. And this brings me on to wanted to talk about why I am so frustrated that this is just not super friendly to use. With my games consoles, I want to keep them as convenient and easy to use so that me or anyone in the house can easily play games on them. I also don't want to have unnecessary clutter where possible. So the fact that I have to use a Windows or Linux computer to install games with, and I have to remove the drive in order to have a reliable and fast transfer of games is... Uh... And I'm sure that people will mention SMB servers or USB drives to play games, however, I prefer to use a hard drive in the PS2 as then I can take my console with me and not worry about an extra thing or having no games on there. I also find it kind of silly to use an external USB drive which is limited to 1 megabyte a second over USB 1.1 when I have a 40 megabyte a second hard disk drive right there. Now don't take this as me being ungrateful, the time and effort that these developers have put into making these loaders and tools is great and I'm really appreciative of all of their work, but to me it's just inconvenient when you compare them to the Wii and OG Xbox loaders. Both of them have a much more streamlined approach to using USB drives, or at least using the internal hard drive in the OG Xbox's case, and for the most part they work with either the standard file browser in the Wii's case, or they work with FTP which is available in all the OS versions. So the PS2 basically requiring Windows, or maybe Linux in some cases, it's kind of irritating. So in the end, I've just resorted to having to install my games using HDL installer from original game DVDs. Which works well enough, and I do have a method to put others on there if I needed to, in the form of Windows HDL installer. But despite my frustrations with the software, I can at least still play the games more conveniently at the end of it. Five, four, two, one. Spread your wings and fly, God be with you.